So as I said, it's an immense pleasure for me to welcome you to this special colloquium inserted in the webinar series of the Graduate Program in Physics of the Federal University of Pará in Amazonia, Brazil. I ask everyone to kindly leave the microphone and camera turned off, except for the moment you're going to speak. Questions will be allowed in the end, unless otherwise requested by the speaker. The, question can be asked, the questions can be asked using the chat here in the Google Meet room or in the YouTube. Today, we have the great honor to listen to Professor John Michael Kosterlitz, who was awarded with the 2016 Nobel Prize in Physics, together with David Taulis and Friedrich Haldane, for theoretical discoveries of topological phase transitions and topological phases of matter. Professor Mike Kosterlitz received his bachelor and master's from Gonville and Caius College at Cambridge University in England, and his PhD in high energy physics in Oxford University in 1969. He has engaged in research at the Institute, Instituto di Fisica Teorica in Torino, Italia, and in the United States of America at Cornell University, Princeton University, Bell Telephone Laboratories, and Harvard University. He has also served on the faculty of the Department of Mathematical Physics at the University of Birmingham. Presently, our special guest is the Harrison Farnsworth Professor of Physics at Brown University in the United States of America. Apart from the Nobel Prize in Physics, Professor Kostelitz's research has been honored with the Maxwell Medal and Prize from the British Institute of Physics in 1981 and the Lars Onsager Prize from the American Physical Society in 2000. Since 1993, he has been a fellow of the American Physical Society. State selection by stochastic stochastic noise in a driven out of equilibrium system is what Professor Kostelitz will tell us about today, and I should not make you wait longer to listen to him. Professor Kostelitz, thank you very much once again for having accepted our invitation, and from this moment on, the audience is yours. Well, thank you very much, and I'm very honored to be uh, speaking to this group. And my subject uh, in particular is what is called wavelength selection in a noisy Langevin equation. Now, in general, the problems, oh, yeah, sorry, let me say, the, the paper, this work I'm going to talk about was more performed when I was on leave absence in China, and it was done with uh, Yong Kong Chen, um, to, uh, I can never pronounce his names, Chun Chao, Shi, uh, Chao Mei, Zhu, and Peng Ao at the Shanghai Center for Quantitative Life Sciences and Physics Department. Uh, some of the other work uh, was done by my graduate students, Saloni Saxena and myself, um, and a couple of references are by work by Saloni and myself given below. Um, and the second paper where I only discovered was been accepted actually today. Okay, so now the aim of of this work is to study the phenomenon of state selection in a noisy driven out of equilibrium system. Now Actually, we've met, uh, you know, the systems evolve, dynamical systems evolving um, in time, in particularly in the approaching equilibrium. If I take a system uh, and it started off at some some state, uh, in in just leave it sitting in some environment, it will evolve towards equilibrium with, 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 with the environment. And now this situation can be described by an equation of motion where the driving force can be written as a derivative of some potential. 
and it's in 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 this case it's pretty obvious well it doesn't take much uh, work to convince yourself of the fact that you all learn from <clears throat> uh, your first class in statistical mechanics that the stationary state the final stationary state the system reaches is uh, a, an equilibrium state described by the you know the usual Boltzmann distribution and now this is quite easy to uh, explicitly show for a for a equation of motion where the driving force is governed by uh, it can be written as a derivative of a potential now if however you in order to guarantee that the system it evolves finally to the state described by the deepest minimum of the free energy. It's essential to have some additive stochastic noise. Without this additive stochastic noise, the system doesn't end up in a unique state because suppose you have some uh, potential surface you know where the state starts at some point in the surface and it, basically what it does it slide it slides down this, the hill but it's a sticky hill I mean. and so that if this hill happens to have some local minimum in it the first local minimum that the system arrives at it'll it'll stop there and stay there forever if there's no noise however if there's if there's some stochastic noise added on then the stochastic noise will fluctuate the system around it will it will take it over the uh, the hill and it will continue sliding down the hill towards the absolute minimum of course in the presence of stochastic noise you know once it reaches the absolute minimum the stochastic noise will of course eventually drive the system out of the minimum but on, it will, but the system will spend m the great majority of its time in the in the absolute minimum, and so therefore, this means that this that the system, the equilibrium state of the system is described by the min minimum of the, of the free energy, which you all learn in statistical mechanics. Now. An important point is that for the system relaxing to equilibrium with the environment in the presence of external stochastic noise, this is of course the thermal noise, and the eventual stationary time independent state is the is corresponds to the Boltzmann distribution, and this is independent of initial the initial this initial distribution. And of course, remember, stochastic noise is essential for this. And as I said, in the absence of noise, the system ends up in its first local free energy minimum. Now, the natural question to ask is, does something similar happen for a driven out of equilibrium system? In other words, is the very late time state or distribution unique and independent of the initial state? What is the effect of stochastic noise? Does it select the fi a final state as in the evolution to equilibrium? Now, the natural uh, way of objection to this is, th is that it, usually the dynamics of a, of a system is described by some deterministic equation. And of course, the deterministic equation, you know, evolves, but it's it evolves in a way that depends on this, its initial conditions. And with the deterministic evolution, there is no um, final, you know, no unique final state, because the final state simply corresponds to whatever free energy minimum the system arrives at and gets stuck in. And which one it gets stuck in depends on where it starts from, how and how you know how it evolves. And so, 
if a system is going to evolve to a final stationary state, a unique stationary state, independent of initial conditions, then it must have some stochastic noise um, put onto the system. And the question is, does this stochastic noise select the final state as in the evolution to equilibrium? And we think the answer is yes. Unfortunately, um, a analytic description of this evolution in general is impossible, or at least put it this way, we can't do it. And so most, most studies of this phenomenon are numerical. But there is one analytic study which supports the hypothesis that there is that a driven out of equilibrium system does evolve to a final stationary state, assuming a stationary state exists. And there is an analytic study which supports this hypothesis in a very simple toy model. And that's really what I want to talk about. And the system I want to, I'm going to use is something called the kuramoto sivashinsky equation with some noise added on. And this is a very simple equation of motion. Let's suppose the, the field, let's call the field going to work in one dimension. So the field H is a function of X and T. T is time. And the evolution equation is the time derivative of this field is equal to a linear term plus this um, dh by dx squared ter nonlinear term plus some stochastic noise, zeta. Now, this, this linear operator is L hat. It's very simple. It's just some alpha, uh, some con which is a constant, plus the second derivative with respect to x plus the fourth derivative with respect to x. Now, with the sign I've chosen, with the minus sign in this, you know, in front of this linear operator, the, 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 the term d, d by dx squared is, an, is a destabilizing term because if I go to Fourier, Fourier space, this corresponds to um, minus minus q squared. The fourth, fourth derivative is a stabilizing term because that corresponds to plus q to the fourth. And so you see, because, because the, 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 the dx, the second derivative is a destabilizing term corresponding to minus q, q squared in Fourier space, this obviously, as far as the Fourier components is concerned, this gives me a destabilizing term. And the, the constant alpha is, is picked, is chosen appropriately, appropriately. And in fact, it's not hard to show that if you only consider the linear equation of motion, forget about the nonlinear term and the noise for the moment, that this, uh, I don't know what the, why I did that. This uh, term becomes uh, has a because is negative in, in Fourier space is negative if alpha is less than a quarter. In other words, if alpha if it chooses alpha greater than a quarter. Um, every mode decays to zero. But if alpha is less than a quarter, in the just just taking the linear term, there's a band of modes that are un linearly unstable. So as time evolves, they will grow. And in fact, so when these these linear modes grow, they they grow to a certain point, but then they get mixed up together by the nonlinear term, which eventually spits out one particular uh, Fourier mode, uh, which dominates at the end of the day. And this is, uh, so this all happens for alpha, this 
uh, control parameters alpha lying between a quarter and four over 25. The point is the lower value, four over, four over 25 alpha gets, that range, the quarter and four over 25, only the, the fundamental mode is linearly unstable. You know, the, the uh, second harmonic and so on, that, that, is, that decays to zero. And so there's only one mode, we don't need to worry about a single mode when alpha is chosen between a quarter and four over 25. And this is all spelled out in this reference by Ms. Van Valance um, back in 1994. Of course, what we really want to know is what is the effect of the nonlinear term and the stochastic noise? The stochastic noise is chosen to be additive and it's chosen from a Gaussian distribution of mean zero. There's two ways of approaching this problem, this system. You can either uh, do numerical simulations, but more recently, um, in fact, last year, uh, I, we wrote a paper, I wrote a paper with some Chinese collaborators, which actually does, manages to do things semi-analytically. Now, the equation of motion, as shown by, by Ping Ao, back in, 90, back in 2004, well, we had to, we had to of course, um, uh, generalize his treatment. He did it for a, a system with a finite number of degrees of freedom. And of course, our system's got an infinite number of degrees of freedom. But he showed that the evolution equation for the field can be written in the form uh, of the, of the, uh, of um, this, this, the equation below. And in fact, which is equivalent to a matrix equation. So if I, if I write the H of X as a matrix for every, every value of X, then I can write that can write the H as a, as a column vector. And of course it depends on time. So I can write DH by DT is equal to minus, you know, a matrix D plus a matrix Q dotted into the derivative of, a, of some potential. With respect to it, with respect to the field H, and the important point is this matrix D is is can be shown to be purely symmetric, and Q anti-symmetric, and so all the the dissipation is contained in in this op matrix or operator D. So you can now go to the next slide. Uh, uh, Saloni succeed and, and I had earlier done some numerical simulations of the original Langevin equation. And we found in the presence of with with in the presence of the stochastic noise, there seemed to be some wa a wavelength selection, a unique periodic state is picked out. Now remember the deterministic equation has a band of possible stationary periodic states. But when we apply the stochastic noise, a unique periodicity is picked out. And here's a particular um, you know, graph. This is the noise spectrum uh, of plotted against um, the uh, wavelength or the wave number, if you like, with, oops, what happened there? Can I go back one? We could write Q as two pi times an integer divided by the length of the system, which I call NH. And, and this simulation is done with 4,000 grid points 
with a, with a lattice spacing of, of a half. And the, 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 the selected Q wave number is sort of plotted here. And notice that a unique wave number seems to be picked out with the stochastic noise. But interestingly, there's a lot of, there's quite a bit of, uh, um, of low, of, of, of long wavelength, a low, small Q excitations present. And these are, very, these are actually very important. But there it seems to be a, a, way, a particular wave number picked out, and there's a very small uh, second harmonic peak here. Now, and so this, see, this numerical work seemed to be rather intriguing because it led to some results which are basically against one's natural intuition because the natural intuition says that if you put some noise onto a system, it's going to mess up whatever the deterministic, the noise free version uh, tells you. But exactly the opposite seems to happen is that here in the presence of noise, the a particular wave number seems to be picked out much more than other wave numbers. And so this needed some explanation. And so what we tried to do, we tried to basically go back to the formalism of Ping Ao and construct, because what the formalism of Ao and company says is that despite the fact that the original Langevin equation, uh, you can't write the driving force as a derivative of a potential, or not obviously. There is a, you can formulate this uh, problem these problems for are basically arbitrary dynamics in terms of, of a potential function. Now, so we'd, we'd like to, what we tried to do was to act cons explicitly construct the potential function for this particular simple Langevin equation. You know, it's the Kuramoto-Sivajinsky problem, if you like. And um, the linear term in the, in the equation, original equation of motion being generated from a quadratic potential, right? Because basically, if you take this quadratic potential here and differentiate respect to h, h of x, this will produce the linear term in the Langevin equation. Uh, <clears throat> but then, of course, the problem is that the nonlinear term, which numerical uh, analysis will tell you that is essential for selection, you ha we have to somehow incorporate that. And this can be done by choosing the matrix Q, remember, we had, a, we had two matrices, the D and the Q. Well, the D matrix basically is, can be, uh, is, is, is incorporated here, um, or some of it is here. And the, this matrix Q, we can choose the, we can construct the, a matrix Q by choosing equal to this matrix G, which is just this simple expression times the, the derivative of h with respect to x times the inverse of the linear operator ty, times acting on d by dx prime of delta x minus x prime. And this will reproduce the equation of motion, which is what we need to do. But this g is not, is not anti-symmetric. So we can't equate 
this the matrix Q which we're looking for, this anti-symmetric matrix Q with this with this G, but we can write it as G minus G dagger, would say, you know, it's 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 a it's it's a measured conjugate or it's it's uh, uh it's you know it's adjoint so we can write this g minus g dagger over two but once we've done that we have to uh restore the diffusion matrix to its original form which is just the, the unit matrix and so you can write the diffusion matrix as one uh, the unit matrix plus g plus g dagger half g plus g dagger but this um, diffusion matrix D, come on, is not is not symmetric. Oh, sorry, it's not positive definite because of the G plus G dagger uh, term in it, and so we have to adjust it to make to make D positive definite. But once we adjust D. This will we change D, this will cause a change in Q and will cause a change in the potential phi. And to, so we have to, to, the potential has to be changed from phi naught, the, the, uh, the quadratic potential, to some phi naught plus, you know, what call, we call phi tilde. And the, relate, and the connection between the G and the, Q, the G Q and the and the potential is given in the equation in the equation below here. Now the G minus Q acting on the gradient of phi naught is unit minus the unit matrix plus Q acting on the gradient of this extra piece phi tilde has to be zero. So give if we can find the matrices Q and phi tilde which satisfy uh, this equation, then we have constructed um, a global potential which, whose minimum will give us the noise selected wavelength. And, and of course, the, the immediate thought is that one should be able to apply this to other systems, selection other systems such as directional certification, eutectic growth, the uh, you know, the, the the evolution of periodic convection cells and so on and so forth and but this is work for the future now let's talk about the state that see if we can figure out what happens uh, if when we have a, a stationary time independent state and let's call the state, a stationary state, let's call it A of X. That's, it doesn't have any time dependence, therefore, you know, you can call the stationary state A of X, and it must obey the Langevin equation, which can be written in the form, the linear operator acting on this uh, stationary state A is equal to dA by dx all squared. So it must, have, must obey that now. It's possible uh, to construct, as I said, the 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 quadra there's a quadratic potential phi naught, and there's this matrix G, which now depends on the actual stationary state A, and this can be written as dH by dx plus dA by dx times the inverse um, op linear operator times d by dx prime of delta x minus x prime. It took us a while to figure out, realize that it can be done like that. You can write it like that. Now remember that the, that uh, this field h can be written as a plus h tilde. But the, the matrix G one might from its original form you might expect can be written as just h tilde x plus a, plus a plus a sub x but no it can't because in order in order to reproduce the original Langevin equation the only choice that will do it 
in the vicinity of a, of a, of a finite stationary state is this the, you have to write g as h the derivative of h plus the derivative of a t uh, t times this operator now at this point it's convenient to define a new matrix a which is g times the linear operator and this we can write a naught plus a sub one for a naught um, depends only on the form of the stationary state small a and it could be written as 2a a, twice dA by dx. Uh, sorry about that. Times the derivative of the delta function and the a sub 1, which depends on the on the deviation h tilde, I can write as dh tilde by dx times uh, the derivative of the delta function. Now, now near a at a fixed point, at a stationary state, then the this op this operator a simply becomes a naught. In other words, the the uh, the a h tilde goes to zero, and uh, what for dots up here? And you see, I can write the I can define a force as the gradient of the, of the potential, right? You know, I assume that I can write. The, the, the driving force F as the gradient of this potential phi. And so since phi is, the potential is quadratic in uh, H tilde, I can write the part of the force that depends on H tilde as some matrix R naught times H tilde plus uh, higher order terms in the, in the small quantity H tilde. Where this matrix R naught, I can write as I plus the inverse of I plus Q naught times the L plus A naught. And it's a bit of a bit of algebra will tell you that the relationship between these various matrix matrices is given by this equation here. And then one can one can argue that the correction to the potential. The next term in the potential is um, of this of, of this form here, and so basically, what what we've done is to succeed in constructing a potential whose minimum will give you the will, will get, tell you tell you the stationary states for the simplest possible model for a noisy driven out of equilibrium system. And you see, we found the most probable state analytical, analytically, and in fact, it agrees reasonably well with the best available numerical work. I, I won't say that the agreement is perfect. It certainly isn't. But it's in reasonable agreement with the best available numerical work. And the method seems general, but needs more work to apply it to more realistic physical systems. And in particular, I would encourage um, uh, young, people younger than I am to pursue this sort of problem involving random noise, because the random noise seems to act as a selection mechanism to pick out a particular time-independent state in these driven systems. Now, you might say, you might argue that this is a completely unrealistic problem. And yes, I agree, it is unrealistic. But it's a, it's a simple system, and it, we you know, regard it as a test case. And of course, a natural um, um, natural system in which applying these sorts of ideas, if they work, would be in biology, because in a biological system, seems to 
be a very efficient, very effective at growing patterns. You know, like you and me. We are, we are, because after all, if you're growing a, bo a human body, human bodies, they're, basically they're all the same. They all end up roughly, you know, the adult, an adult human being is roughly two meters tall and it's got, you know, uh, four major protruben protuberances, two arms, two legs. And so the pattern, the, uh, the, 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 the form of every human being, adult human being is essentially the same. And certainly a human being or any other animal is driven out of equilibrium system because after all, uh, you, you, drive, you drive the system by eating food because you need to supply the system with energy all the time because if you stop applying with, supply driving with with this energy input of food this the 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 system tends to tends to die and so animals adult animals can be i think believe can be regarded as stationary time you know and those time independent driven out of equilibrium systems and a, a given species of a given adult species of animal is, is pretty much unique no matter how they start off with and how you know what the food supply is like and so on but they all end up in in essentially the same the same uh final pattern stationary adult pattern and also in these biological systems every biological uh, evolving biological system is certainly evolving in a very noisy environment so uh, it certainly must be robust against noise you know that the the, the the strength of the noise should not affect the final the final state too much Okay, so let's go back to our system. Okay, so we, con we, we construct the potential five, is what we can do that numerically. And once we've got the potential five, which is a function of the field, we can construct the driving force F by simply taking minus the gradient of this potential with respect to H. And this for driving force can be written in this form here. And of course, the potential can be written as the integral of uh, the path integral of this force with respect to H. And so we are now, how do we construct the potential? Now, suppose we've got two stationary states, nearby stationary states, A of X and B of X. And let's call C of X the, uh, the difference between the two stationary states, B minus A. Then the potential difference between uh, between state A and B can be written uh, in the form of a half C dagger times um v lambda v dagger minus it's it's uh, co that complex conjugate the times the uh matrix the the vector c and uh, where v sub b a is the eigen is the eigen mode of r of the matrix r At a state at a state A flowing from state A to B. Now, so phi B V sub B A corresponds to an eigenmode flowing from state A to state station state A to station state B. Now knowing the change of the potential, this delta phi sub B A, we could construct the potential language landscape i beg your pardon phi phi of kappa at each kappa 
So we do that. And we compare, um, and then we can minimize that, that phi with respect to, to find the actual, uh, the selected state. And here is a, is a plot of all the predictions of the various competing theories. Um, and the, the plot is, the vertical axis is the value of Q. which uh, is certainly this 0.71 means basically one of root, it's actually the exact value is one of a square root of two. And on the horizontal axis, we've got values of alpha from uh, 0.17 up to 0.25. Point is, at, for alpha, if alpha is greater than 0.25, there are no, uh, periodic states produced. And if alpha is less than 0.16, actually, then uh, we have two, the first, the fundamental mode and the second, and the first, um, first harmonic are simultaneously unstable and you get much more complicated um, states appearing, things like breathing modes, et cetera, et cetera. So we're not considering such values of alpha. This is work for the future. Now, there are several different uh, uh, attempts here. The, 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 the top line, the, the top curve, comes from uh, work done by, with Dino, it's all numerical work, done with Dino Obeyed and myself. And these are the predictions of the selected wavelength for various values of alpha, what's happened to my my stupid curve. Oh, there it is. Now, this the next point, the, the dot, red dotted line, that corresponds to um, some work done by Michael Cross and, and co-workers back in 2000, and, I think it was 2000, can't remember when it was. The blue line with the points corresponds to the predictions analytic analytic set the analytic slash numerical predictions of uh, of the paper by uh, chen and company and the lowest curve corresponds to some simulations by saloni succina and myself now not, it's not surprising that the deviation, that the curves, the upper curves deviate from each other because um, they're done with different, you know, different degrees of sophistication and so on. Oh dear, what is going on here? What is a bit surprising is that the the the, the numerical work by uh, Saloni Saxena and myself, the lowest curve, and this curve of the analytic results from the work I've described, why these differ so much. Now, the point, of course, the point is there's all some errors in numerical work and in, uh, in some errors in all work. And of course, the difference between the Q, the, the, the Q values is not big. I mean, it's less than, you know, 0 0.02 between, uh, for alpha, you know, the, this value of alpha between this curve and this one. So, you know, it's 0 0.67 and here is 0 0.655 or so. So it's very little difference and that, could be with an error box. And so the, the uh, I've labeled these curves A, B, C, and D, 
And on the last slide, there are a set of references with the A, B, C, and D beside the references from where the, 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 the results were taken. And this uh, problem of wavelength selection has been around for a long time. It's been the first person who tried doing investigating it was Michael Kurtzberg back in 1983. Um, he, he, looked, he looked at wavelength selection directional certification again numerically. Uh, what on earth? And that's really what it, why why I got interested in it after reading uh, Kersberg's work. And so there's a list of people who um, investigated this. There's Ping Ao, he did some work in 2004. There's, uh, there's Quan Ao and Thaulus uh, in 2005. And there's Minsban Valance in uh, 1994, and so on and so forth. Uh, these are basically, these are almost all the, the references I could, uh, could find on the problem of wavelength selection and driven out of equilibrium systems. Now, uh, because there's a lot of work, is some work that I haven't referred to where you look at one looks at systems purely deterministic systems without any stochastic noise and certainly in such systems there is no wavelength selection because in a deterministic system assuming your computers is is totally accurate that the system you end the state you end up in will be determined by the initial conditions was a determinant, you know, was a deterministic simulation, and so discount uh, papers work involving um, talking about selection in deterministic systems, because, as I said, the the state is the state in a deterministic system, the state selected will depend on your in initial conditions. Now, okay, so that's really all I have to say because these um, A, B, C, and D correspond to the, 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 the papers from which I, I, I pulled out um, those numerical curves that were shown in the last slide. I think that's actually the last slide of the talk. Let me just see. Yeah, that's it. So. Okay. Okay. So me, yeah, yeah, I was just going to say I've tried to discuss the problem of state selection driven out of algorithm systems described the work that I've been involved in and I've talked about other work. And as far as we can tell, if you are looking for a unique selection, the selection of a unique state, independent of initial conditions, then stochastic noise is essential which, which uh, uh, some people find very surprising, but it, it's analogous to the approach to equilibrium with a, with a potential system. We know that the final uh, equilibrium state is determined by the minimum of the potential, uh, you know, free energy or potential. And the stochastic noise is required to 
make to to guarantee that the selected state co does correspond is actually the minimum of the free energy because if it without the stochastic noise the state you'll end up in will correspond to the, the first local minimum the first local free energy minimum the system arrives at okay so now really that now so what i'm somewhat surprised so su the two surprising things come out of this the first thing is, is the importance of the random noise in the selection process. And the second thing is that the fact that there is an analytic theory um, which, which allows one to construct a potential whose minimum will tell you what the, the selected state is. So, that is really all I want to say. I'd love to say a lot more, but I don't know anymore. And so I won't say anymore. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Michael Krosselitz. So before we proceed, I'll ask everybody to turn on their microphones for us to give a round of applause for this excellent webinar. Thank you very much, Professor Krosselitz. So uh, I'll ask everybody to turn off their microphones again uh, and for register for questions. Uh, but uh, before uh, we proceed to the questions, uh, I would like to give you a panorama of the audience that you have had. So uh, we have we had around 100 people from north to south of Brazil, including the Google Meet room and the YouTube. Uh, where we have the streaming going on and uh, from the north re region for instance uh, Pará state and the northeast like Maranhão, Ceará, Pernambuco, Paraíba, uh, the southeast region, uh, Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro and the south region about more than 4,000 kilometers down to the south from us in Rio Grande do Sul. So ob obviously, uh, this webinar has been uh, uh, organized by the graduate program of the Pará University. So we have here uh, represented our students, postdocs, teachers, professors uh, that are attending both from this room and from YouTube, uh, including, for instance, Professor Angela Clautal, Danilo Alves, Jorge Cassineiras, Manuel Leuterio, and Van Sergio. We have people from other Amazonian universities, like the Federal University of West of Pará, represented here by Professor Edson Azano. Uh, we have postdocs, graduate students, teachers, and professors from federal and state universities and institutes, uh, like of other regions of Brazil, like I can, can mention some of them, Adriano Batista from uh, Campina Grande, Dionísio Bazia Filho from Paraíba, Edson Moreira from uh, Itajubá, Henrique Arias da UERJ, uh, Enzo Granato, that you may recognize, <laughs> who has done the PhD with you a long time ago, Gastão Krein from uh, Unesp, Elia Shapiro from Juiz de Fora, Marcelo Santos from Rio de Janeiro, Raimundo Costa also from, uh, uh, Raimundo Rocha dos Santos also from Rio de Janeiro, Raimundo Costa that you know, also from Universidade of Ceará, uh, Ricardo Mosna, uh, Satish Kumar from Uni, Uni Rio, Sérgio Jorais, Rio de Janeiro, Silvio Salinas from University of São Paulo, Vanderlei Banhato from University of São Paulo, São Carlos, and Vanderbeck Ferreira from uh, Ceará University. We have also people attending from other countries, like for instance, I can mention uh, Alexander Kamenschik uh, that is attending from Bologna in Italy, and as well as Pedro Cunha that is attending from Aveiro in Portugal. So it's quite a, a, a big and representative audience. Uh, so we have uh, compliments in the chat, uh, beautiful presentation, José Silva says, uh, David Pastana, an excellent presentation, thank you. And uh, going to Satish Kuma, the first question. So please, Satish, uh, could you please uh, turn on your uh, microphone and make your question? Thank you, Luis. Um, uh, 
Th thank you, sir, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, I have a question regarding what, what you suggested uh, about a random noise choosing some time independent state in living systems, right? Uh, everything seems to be time dependent in a living system. So I, I wonder what do you have in mind for a time independent um, state well, in a biological I mean, system? The sort of thing I was thinking of, like, yeah. like I was saying, that an adult animal, you can regard the animal as some sort of, uh, you know, you got the animals are driven out of equilibrium system. And in the adult state, it seems to be pretty much stationary. Because if an adult doesn't change much over time, at least, you know, not over, not, over a not few years. And so one might think of an adult animal as a stationary system, time independent system, but it's certainly driven, it's not in equilibrium. And the noise, you see, the point is that uh, a natural objection one could make to our physical system is that the noise is going to screw, is going to mess thing, mess things up, and and also if any results, the noise we ha apply in our numerical uh, simulations is way bigger than any physical physical noise in a real system. And we're trying to say that, look, it doesn't matter because if you take sort of noise, you know, it's additive Gaussian distributed noise, the strength of the noise doesn't seem to matter. I mean, it matters in the sense that if you, if you have a very small noise, this system will take forever to reach stationary state. And so, you know, it's, it takes too long for, for, for uh, a reasonable computer to, to reach a stationary state. And so, you know, the, a natural objection is that the noise strengths we use are way bigger than the, the noise in whatever physical system we're trying to describe. And that objection is, of course, fair enough. But we would also claim that the pattern, the selected state is actually independent of the noise strength. Now, of course, this is very difficult to show in general because really what one should do is to you know do simulations with very small very small noise and big then bigger and bigger um from there but the very no low noise simulations are impossible because the dam system never takes forever to reach its final asymptotic state to settle down we tried that you know and after after f f three or four days running we just gave up because it hadn't settled down. So, uh, you know, in order to really uh, verify the conjecture that the actual state arrived as independent of the noise strength, um, you know, is, is, is very difficult. But we still believe that it's true. Okay, I, I think Schrodinger did the inverse problem many, many years ago, much before the discovery of DNA in his, in his famous book, What is Life? I think he used the um, noise has to be, using the strength of the noise, he said the DNA, right, the, the aperiodic crystal uh, must, be, must be not too small, right? So he, he, he kind of put a, a lower limit on what, should the, what, what the size of the molecule should be. Uh, well, I think he, he did the inverse of uh, Yeah, but the trouble is yeah. that if you, unless you have some analytic theory, if you're doing things, if you're doing things numerically, which is, which, you know, we're forced to do, uh, you know, if you choose a noise that's too small, 
you know, the, you don't have the computer never reaches the asymptotic state. The state continues to evolve no matter how long you run it for. Yeah, you know, because you can't run it long enough. So you see the the problem here. But as you know, as far as we can tell, the pattern that's selected actually is independent of the noise strength. At least for stronger noise strengths, it doesn't actually. You know, if we, if we you know, start off with some noise strength, for which the you know for which the computer reaches a um, some stationary state in a reasonable time, it doesn't matter how much we increase the noise strength by, um, except that, of course, the pattern gets, the, 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 the stronger the noise, the, the messier the pattern gets, but the periodicity doesn't change. Okay, so uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Satish, for your question. Thank you, uh, Professor Mike Kostelis, for your answer. Uh, uh, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful webinar. It was a real profound webinar, which we, in my case, I'll have to see it again to digest uh, all the concepts that have been exploited here, since it's out of my field. But uh, I'll let uh, people know that in, in 10 to 15 days' time, uh, Professor Mike Kosterlitz will again uh, give a, a webinar to the Brazilian audience organized by the Condensed Matter uh, Area Commission of the Brazilian Physics Society. I normally don't announce uh, the future webinars, but in this special case, that is going to be uh, the same speaker that's going to uh, uh, honor us with the second talk more focused in his uh, Nobel, uh, Physics Nobel Prize. So I invite you all to meet Professor Kostelitz there uh, in 10 days' time. So I'll ask everybody to turn on their microphones again for a final round of applause to acknowledge for this uh, excellent webinar from Professor Mike Kostelitz. Thank you very much, Professor.